Good morning everyone and welcome to our service of Holy Communion on this the second Sunday of Advent. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We come to light the second candle on our Advent wreath and I know you won't need me to tell you who it's for. <laughs> So the first one last week was for the patriarchs, and the second one this morning is for prophets. Yeah. Prophets. David, a voice, <laughs> a voice in the wilderness, or at least in the cubby hole. <laughs> Blessed are you, sovereign Lord, just and true. To you be praise and glory forever. Of old you spoke by the mouth of your prophets, but in our days you speak through your Son, whom you have appointed the heir of all things. Grant us, your people, to walk in his light, that we may be found ready and watching when he comes again in glory and judgment. For you are our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Our first hymn this morning is, thank you, <laughs> 286. <laughs>
So we pray together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Lens the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord have mercy. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light those things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. As we pray, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in this life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Branch from Jesse. A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. <clears throat> the wolf still will live with the lamb, 
The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear and the young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson comes from Romans 15, starting at verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord all you Gentiles, let all the people extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jess will spring up, who will arise to rule over the nations, in him the Gentiles will hold. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our graduate of him this morning, 589. <laughs>
written in that according to St. Matthew, the third chapter, beginning to read at the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare for the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptising, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This morning we lit the second candle on our Advent wreath for the prophets, and yet the main reading this morning is a gospel which tells the story of John the Baptist. Don't worry, I haven't for once got it wrong. It makes a very important point that John, who we will recall more fully next week, is unique in being in every respect the last of the Old Testament prophets and the first of what became known as the witnesses to the gospel in the New Testament. Those who even at risk of their own lives bore witness to Jesus. We know from our reading of the New Testament that the teachings of the prophets, especially those parts which could be seen in retrospect to refer to Jesus and his coming, were important to the earliest Christians and to understanding the origins of their faith and the purposes of God in Jesus Christ. Seeing that Jesus' life was foretold in some detail by the prophets, early Christians could get a better understanding of what this Messiah, this modern day prophet, actually was about. And Jesus, like John, acted in many ways like the Old Testament prophets. They universally called on the people of Israel to think again, to repent of the many ways in which they'd failed the covenant between themselves and God made with the patriarchs, and not only followed other gods, but also in so doing lost sight of their own God's priorities, which were not the wars and the power struggles of their age, bore a deep and profound caring for the weakest, for the most vulnerable, seeking to sow seeds of peace and fairness, of kindness and justice in a cruel and unkind world. In the prophets, God began a prolonged conversation with his chosen people, but one, as we know, that was often listened to, if at all, very poorly. Because of that, the prophets often had a very rough time, as anyone 
like whistleblowers in the modern age can affirm, there's rarely a pleasant reception for the, those who bring you bad news, or who question the status quo, or who point out the failings and flaws of individuals and of society itself. Often prophets were considered troublemakers in their day, and I'm glad to say many were troublemakers. Uh, that was their job. We know from our own day that many risked their lives in an effort to speak truth unto power, to bring urgent messages about our treatment of the planet and its resources, or to protest against the treatment of men, of girls and women, and so many other important issues. And it seems to me that usually looking back after brave people have spent lifetimes arguing for change and reform is only when people finally get the point. And I want to add in something which isn't in the script, and that's a confession, because um, there are prophets in every age, and mercifully, they can be in your own house. So when uh, I was writing this sermon and thinking about it, uh, one evening I sounded off about some modern day prophets, uh, the people who campaigned for just oil and the people who campaigned for Extinction Rebellion. And I was quite vocal about how annoyed I get about them. And I was quite rightly pointed out by a prophet in my own house that uh, that rather contradicted what I was going to stand up and say this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and I confess it did. And I confess that I'm grateful and that I've spent a great deal of the rest of the week wondering how I had the nerve to write this and still but then again, you know, sometimes truth needs to be spoken and, and heard. I heard it and I'm grateful. Only a hundred years before my birth, conditions for the poor in our cities in this country were simply appalling. Work for many was often dangerous and shortened your life. The judicial and the school systems, if they existed, were brutal and merciless. The voices of women and children were unheard and folks saw the gap between the rich and the poor not as something to be challenged, but as a natural order of things, when in fact the scriptures universally proclaim the right of all to benefit equally from God's blessings. Those who fought for change, who stood up to be counted, were often as unpopular as the prophets themselves. People don't like to hear bad news, those in power and comfort don't like the thought of having to cede their privilege or make a change. Little has altered in that. I think the connection of John the Baptist today with the tradition of the Old Testament prophets brings to mind another important element, and that's the element of authenticity. The prophets and John the Baptist speak difficult to hear messages ones that often weren't understood in their own lifetimes, and yet they lived lives that were consonant with what they said. Without such authenticity, folks would not see or hear the value of what they said. And yet today, we've people in public offices and leadership roles, and in the clergy, in government and business who are not living authentic lives, whose own behaviour isn't up to the basic standards of decency, decency they pretend to support, when are often motivated by power and money when proclaiming falsely higher moral values. And the most worrying aspect of this is in the modern world, the ease with which truth can be manipulated and lies and distortions used as if they were authentic and honest things. I'm sure that in human history, it's not a new thing for leaders to have told lies, but never before have some taunted us with their ability to avoid the rigour of truth, not to pay tax, not to confess what they've done, not to report honestly to investigations and open themselves up to scrutiny that reveals what really counts, what really matters, how one's life attempts to match up to one's belief, hopes and values. We won't always get it right, but it should be a journey that we're always on. Our Old Testament lesson today from Isaiah brings out another aspect of the prophets. 
We know that they were very good at being awkward and very good at telling people off and pretty good about predicting, predicting the future. But there's another important aspect to prophecy, and that is their ability to have visions, to have dreams, to see the world in a different way, to project onto the world how God wishes to see the world, how he wishes us to see the world, what his plan and his desire is. And they paint a vision which is always, of course, not the reality of what's happening around them or us, but what defines what the kingdom of God could look like, should look like. Their visions of what we should be aiming at. And central to these visions that it was to Isaiah this morning, is always seeking an understanding which gives us a desire to create a world worthy of God, a world which the prophets can see will require a thirst for justice and mercy, the only true way to protect the vulnerable, a world in which everyone seeks to lead a righteous life, an honest and authentic life, speaking truth, acting with mercy, working for justice. I'm quoting Micah, you can hear it, it's in, it's in the Eucharist. It, this, is, this is quoting the prophet Micah, providing those who cannot provide for themselves. And the prophets are sensible enough to realize we won't get all this right in a single instant. It is the work of a lifetime and for everyone. And yet having laid down the gauntlet and set the mark and standard, that is the important issue. The prophets point towards not only that Jesus will come into the world at the moment God chose for the purpose of revealing his long-awaited Messiah, to show that God indeed never gives up on us and has been working for good in dark situations always, but further that in his incarnation, God will show us the ultimate actions of love, Jesus' willingness to confront death itself, to reveal the vision of the kingdom. It's one which is larger than this life alone, takes us into the presence and the eternity of God, but in reality, of course, is the vision of the heavenly realm to which we are all called. So we give thanks for the prophets who point towards Jesus and lay the groundwork for us better to understand his work and ourselves, and also pray that we may recognize and listen to the prophets that God continues to call everywhere and in every generation. Amen. Amen. We stand to affirm our faith in the words of the group. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of our being with the Father, through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation. Amen. And we have the Virgin and the same man, for our sake, it's the entire He suffered death and his on the third day of the resurrection, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the throne. He will come again for his right and his kingdom will come to an end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Who has spoken through our hearts. We believe in one holy Catholic and that soul church. We acknowledge the practice of the and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us pray.
as we wait for the coming of our Saviour, may we humbly acknowledge our human frailties that lead to so much suffering in the world. Don't let us forget the true meaning of Christ's birth. Love came down at Christmas. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings in our lives. Keep us faithful to your teachings. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray to the lead, for the leaders of our church, Archbishop Justin, Bishop Graham, and Bishops Jane and Alan. We give thanks for the ministry of Bishop Alan and ask you to give him every blessing on his retirement. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace in those parts of the world where there is war and unrest, for the people of Ukraine and Russia, where the severe winter weather is adding to the human suffering. Many living in ruins of their homes without electricity. Across the world, there are areas suffering the effects of, effects of global warming, floods and drought causing malnutrition and disease. We ask you to bless those who try to alleviate, alleviate their suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you to bless and guide His Majesty King Charles and his family as they settle to the new duties placed upon them. May his government and opposition lead the country with wisdom and without self-interest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer, Lord, in body, mind or spirit, we ask your healing grace. Bless those who care for them. Give doctors courage, wisdom and compassion when they have to make difficult, life-changing decisions. Give comfort to those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We continue our ministry of prayer for Gwen Wallace, Sarah, Amelia, Kelly Sanderson, Christine Rayner, Brian Rayner, Anna Lott Smith, Matthew Wise, Isla West, Stephen Milner, Julia, Richard Rappel, Megan Mills, Linda Dunstan, Susan Townsend, Roy Wallace, and Peter Ashton. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all who have been faithful disciples, who have heeded your call and obey your commands. We pray for those who now serve you with your saints in glory, especially those recently departed, Jill Bloom, David Kirkland, Joe Uni, Barbara Penny, Peter Goddard, Kathleen Lovick, Eric Gill, John Stanbridge, and Emily Hoyle. And in those whose earth uh, anniversary occurs at this time, Elsie Buckley, Becky Brown, Gloria Smith, Herbert Dawes, Leslie Pearl, Robert Eggleton, Heather Hipkin, Richard Fulton, and John Evans. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. George, St. James the Great, and St. Nicholas, whose feast day is tomorrow, and all your saints, we commend ourselves and one another to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand for the peace? In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace the peace of the lord be always with you i also with you peace be with you
you'd like to sit just a moment. You'll be relieved and pleased to know that after the service, we are serving coffee, hot coffee and hot tea. Yay! So we'll be able to thank you very much for that. It may even be a biscuit for the well-behaved. So don't forget to go. Uh, and just, uh, you'll see the notices for this week on your uh, pew service. There is communion here as normal on Wednesday. Uh, the, um, John Stambridge's uh, funeral is later that morning. Um, Barbara Penny's, which isn't on here actually, is uh, tomorrow on Monday. So, um, and then uh, next Sunday, we begin the joyous round of carol services. So uh, yes, get yourself in good voice. And please note that we have a new collective email for the office. So you will see that we have a new office there. Not a new, new office, it's the same office, but a new email, which uh, uh, please use if you need to contact any of us. That would be great. Our offertory hymn this morning, number 766.
Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again, you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your peace to the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy, and peace. And now we give you thanks, because in the coming, in his coming, the day of our deliverance has dawned, and through him you will make all new, as he comes in power and great triumph to judge the world. So we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth. We echo the song of the angels in heaven, ever more praising you and singing. Trusting in the compassion of our God, let us praise our Saviour to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Father in heaven, who sent your Son to redeem the world and will send him again to be our judge, give us grace to imitate him in the humility and purity of his first coming, that when he comes again, we may be ready to greet him with joyful love and firm faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray to God. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We may be offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out to the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make him ready to meet him when he comes in glory. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. And finally, two weeks into Advent, we get O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, 535. serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.